Well, good morning, everyone. While people are still gathering, we'll open a prayer and then we'll uh, start singing and worshiping our Lord. Father, we thank you today that you are here in this place. That God, that no, no matter what the weather's like outside, no matter what uh, the world goes on in the world, Lord God, that you're still you're still here and that you're still touching people's lives. God, I pray that you stir revival in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing Men of Faith Rise Up, or Shout to the North is what it's called. The first verse is Men of Faith. Set me. My God, my Savior has ransomed. 
Thank you, Jesus. But holy 
Jesus is king. He is alive and he sits on the throne. And he is there waiting for us to, to be with him. But until that day, the spirit resides in our hearts. And we have the opportunity to look and, and to ponder and to fellowship with the, the spirit of God. We're on 1 Corinthians chapter 13 today. If you want to open your Bibles to that, we're going to read the whole chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Everybody knows this chapter or has heard this chapter at a wedding or whatnot. It's the love chapter. It says, If I could speak all the languages of the earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. 
If I had the gift of prophecy and I understood all of God's secrets, secret plans and possessed all knowledge. And if I had such faith that I could move mountains and I and but did not love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Love is patient. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable. And it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. Prophecy and speaking in tongues uh, and unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, even, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when full understanding comes, these partial things will become useless. When I was a child, I spoke and thought as a, and reasoned as a child, but when I grew up, I put away childish things. Now we see things imperfectly in a cloudy mirror, but then we shall see everything with perfect clarity. And I know now is partial and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely just as God knows me completely. Three things last forever. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Do you want, just not part of my sermon, but you want to know why that last verse is kind of revealing about the gospel? Because faith is something we do not see. When it's revealed to us, we don't need faith anymore. Hope is something we long for. When Christ is revealed to us, we don't need it anymore. But when we're face to face with him. But love endures forever. And so we, we, are, we are ground ourselves in that. For centuries, if not millennium, people have, have been looking for love. And if I were to use a, a bad country song, they've been looking for love in all the wrong places. How else can we explain the, the record number of, of divorces, the increase in pornography, and the society, the fact that society has tr replaced traditional marriage with alternate lifestyles? So where can we go to find love? Where can we go to find a love that truly works in a world determined to redefine the word itself? We can't go to society because society doesn't have a clue. We can't go to religion because religion abuses and misinterprets his love with rules and regulation. We can't go to Hollywood because Hollywood is just messed up and they misrepresent it. We can't go to authors because they have as much trouble as everyone else defining love. It's, it's one of the longest entries in Webster's Dictionary. Look it up. Love is one of the longest entries in, in Webster's di Dictionary. And in the Greek, there's eight different words to talk about love. We have one. And we have to know what the person is feeling. There's brother In Greek, there's brotherly love. There's erotic love. There's... there's uh, uh, I forget the other one. There's a gap they love. There's, there's eight different types of love in the Greek that they, words they use for love in the Greek language. We've been trying to nail down the definition of love for millennia. And we still haven't got it down yet. So where do we go? Maybe it's time to go to the source of all love and that's the Lord our God. Him alone. Maybe it's time to go back to the one who created us and made us, made within our DNA the need for love. It's time to go back to the Bible, to God's word for his, his creation. That is for you and for me. And it's time to get back to the basics by which life, which we get life and we receive its meaning. And what we're going to see about love's driving priority is, that, is in our job description. The reason I say it like this is because Jesus gave this as a commandment. Which we're going to look at more fully in a, in a moment. But as a job description, Jesus says, A new commandment I give you, that you should love one another as I have loved you, and you also love one another. He didn't say, let's make sure we get our own rights, make sure we get everything the way we want it. He said, love one another. That's why when Jesus was approached, or when, when uh, 
When Jesus said, if someone strikes you on the face, let him strike the other side also. Not because we like abuse, but because we're doing everything out of love. It's love's, love is life's defining priority. Where do I come up with that idea? Well, it happens to be uh, in this book and on your apps, on your phone, if you happen to have those, but uh, uh, it happens to be in that book. Jesus gave it not only as a command, but as life's defining principle. And he does so in several ways. The first, and we've already talked about this, the love is the greatest commandment. This is the first point. Love is our greatest commandment. He also said in Mark 12, 30 and 31, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. That's the first commandment. When somebody yeah. asked him what the greatest commandment was. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other greater commandment greater than these. Love God, love people. Some, some have shortened it to say that. Love God, love people. But that's probably a bit too simplistic. And, and doesn't even accurately convey what Jesus meant by placing the first and the second together. By saying that the second, love your neighbor as yourself. By saying it's, that it's like the first. What Jesus was saying is that if you want to love God with the whole of who you are. With all your heart. With all your soul. With all your mind and strength. Then what do you have to do? You have to love neighbors as yourself. And if you don't love yourself, you need to get a better principle of how God sees you instead of how you see you. That's why if you look at a lot of Jesus' words and frame them with this, these two commandments in, in view, when he, when he says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, that's framed in love. We kind of twist it and say, do to others before they do unto you. Matthew's gospel, Jesus said, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Talking about what we've already read. On those two commandments hang everything written in the first 39 books of the Bible. The, all the law and the prophets is hinged upon the love of God and the love of, of neighbor. Amen, I agree. Somebody's got to say amen. I'm assuming she is, right? So that's... Imagine that. All the law and the prophets, all the writing of the 39 books of the Old Testament, literally hundreds of thousands of words were inspired by God and written down about how to live life on God and His relationship with humanity and on family and human relationships. And they're contained within those two commandments. Also, what we find in these, uh, in these two commandments are God's instructions for a joy-filled and prosperous life. And that's just the start of what Jesus has to tell us about why love is so important and what inspired Paul to write such a great length this definition of love. But Jesus continues by saying that our love of God defines who we are and it's seen in the second principle. If we really love God... What he's saying is that we will love the people. And if we don't love people, now it doesn't mean you don't want, want to be alone sometimes. God created introverts as well. And you're allowed to have, want to have alone time and be, be away from people. But if, we, if you really just don't like people at all, you need to get your heart lined up with God again. You can be irritated at people. Trust me, my wife gets irritated at me all the time. And it's my fault. I just want to let that know it's on camera. It's, it's being recorded. It is my fault. So I can't deny that I said it. But we still have to love them. We still have to desire the best for them. We can't hope that God strike them down. No matter if they're different religion, maybe they're, they're a bit radical and, 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 and odd, we need to love on them just like Jesus loved on them. Love is also the great authenticator. Love authenticates God's call upon our life. In other words, love is what demonstrates to the world our faith in Jesus Christ is real. If we don't have love and the world looks at us and says, you're a Christian? That's not really a good testimony of who Christ is, is it? 
It's not that what we do makes Christ different, but we just aren't representing him well. If you worked for a company and you swore at all the customers that came in the door, you're not a real good representation of what the company, I hope, what the company stands for. They have it within their rights to, to toss you at the door saying, well, you just don't model what we believe. Jesus is the epitome of love and sacrifice. He does not care for what the world thinks of him. He lays himself down, makes himself humble before, before man, died on a cross, a shameful death, and yet we're supposed to act like him and be like him. To lay down our lives for anybody so that the gospel can be, be preached. Jesus said in John 13, 35, By this you will know that they will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So many church splits and so many church, you, know, you have so many denominations around because, uh, you know, you can disagree over theology and you can go be amicable and, and say, well, we're going to worship this way and we're going to, that's fine. But a church split because somebody didn't like the color of the carpet or somebody didn't like the color of the chair or somebody offended somebody, that's not of God. And we need to make sure that God is always center and that we have love for one another. Even the people that seem to make it hard to love. And yeah, I know you're all looking at me saying, yeah, you are hard to love. And today, this marketplace, that was a joke. You could have laughed. Now I really feel you're think that. <laughs> In today's marketplace, there are a lot of knockoffs. If you ever go down uh, any major city, you'll see people selling stuff. Fake Rolexes, Bolexes, or whatever they want to call them, and, and, and fake handbags, and fake clothing that, that has the, looks like and is designed like the original, but costs a fraction of the price. There's a lot of knockoffs in society. There's manufacturers who, who make a living on replicating and duplicating original product lines, even duplicating their logos in, a, in an attempt to make them look just like the original. You see it with Gucci, you see it with, with uh, Yves Saint Laurent, you see all these people that, that have these knockoff items. The same is true when it comes to faith in Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people who look like Christians, but they don't pay the price. They belong to this or that religion, this or that denomination, but have no love. In other words, they haven't accepted their... Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord and they don't have the love of God because Jesus doesn't dwell inside. I've said this before and William Seymour kind of uh, paraphrases Paul here but he, he said, uh, William Seymour was one of the, the, the African American founder of Azusa Street back in 1906 and there was a, a falling out between some of the members and, and there's a racial tensions that went on there just uh, before to, without getting into too much history. William Seymour said, you can claim to speak in tongues or be baptized in the spirit all you want, I'm paraphrasing him, but unless you have love, I doubt your baptism. Love marks who we are. You can be the most giving person, the most uh, praising person, the most, uh, most used in the gifts of the spirit person, if you don't have love, I, like William Seymour, doubt your baptism, doubt your salvation, doubt that God has touched you. And I'm not saying that to criticize you because I'm saying that I need it and you need it. We need to immerse ourselves in the love of God. People look good on the outside, but they're filled with dead man's bones on the inside. They're filled with the, the rotting sepulcher on the inside. Jesus talked about it when he said, talked about the Pharisees, you know, you're like, you're like whitewashed sepulchers. A sepulcher is a grave. You're like whitewashed graves. And, and you have to think, in, in those days, they, their graves were either above ground or in a cave. So if they were above ground, they, they would make the outside look all nice and fancy. They have the same type that they have in, well, older, but the same idea that they use in New Orleans where they have the, the graves above ground because dig and you're going to get water so they have the graves above ground and 
they make them look nice on the outside. You can make a grave look as nice as you want on the outside. What's inside is still not very nice. And so Jesus called the Pharisees whitewashed sepulchers, and we don't want to make our lives like that. And so in order to not be like that, what do we do? We say, more of you, Jesus, less of me. More of your love, less of me. What separates the knockoffs from the real thing? God looks for the true mark of a Christian and when that, and the world looks for the mark of the true mark of the Christian. And what is that, that mark? Nothing more than love. Love is the great apologetic, my third point for today. Whenever we hear the word apology, and Canadians, we're good at this, aren't we? Whenever we hear the word of apology, we think it's more of a common usage, usage as an admission of error and acknowledging a fault. In Canada, if, we, if somebody runs into us, we apologize to them for being in their way. That's kind of messed up. But the term apologetics comes from the Greek language that literally means to speak in defense of something. Early writers who defended the faith were called apologists. You know, when I took apologetics in Bible college, I'm thinking, this is, a, this is how to learn how to apologize to people. I probably need this. Turns out it was learning how to defend what I believed. I needed that too. What this is saying, what, by love being the great apologetic, is saying that love is the greatest defense of the gospel message. 1 John 4, 16 says, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. God is love and God is truth. Deuteronomy uh, 32, 4 says, He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. Jesus in his prayer life called for, uh, to the Father for his, um, and his disciples pray, and he prayed for his disciples and said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth, that they all may be one as you and I are, you are in me and I am you. So that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Sanctify means to set apart, to make holy. And so Jesus is asking the Father here to set us apart by the truth of his word and thus by his love. And by this love that we have for one another, the world will know that Jesus is is truly sent by the Father and that He is the way, that He is the truth, that He is the life, and that no one can come to the Father except through Him. One of the worst things a church can do is get arguing with one another. That's one of the things the devil likes making the church do. Why? Because if we're arguing with one another, we're not focusing on the, on the task that God has for us. And it gives us a bad image in the eyes of the world. The fourth point today is that love is the great essential. What is an essential? Water is an essential. Food is an essential. Air is an essential. In school, reading and writing and arithmetic are essential. In baseball, hitting, pitching, and fielding are essential. In basketball, it's offense, defense, and will you please make foul shots? Webster's again defines essentials as relating or constituting the essence of something. It's something that is the utmost importance, basic and indispensable, an absolute necessity. It is one of the I gotta have or die requirements. You gotta have water. You gotta have food. You gotta have air. We can do an experiment here if you want. Everybody hold their breath until they pass out, and then I'll start preaching again. You'll see how quickly that you need air. Your lungs will start burning when you stop breathing for a while because you need air. It's that that reaction of our, our subconscious that says, breathe, breathe, breathe. When it comes to living and being a disciple of Christ, the big three are faith, hope, and love. 
But love is the greatest. And Paul said, um, now abides faith, hope, and love. But of these three, the greatest is love. Love, therefore, is the greatest essential of life. Or to say it another way, it's the stuff that life is made of. If we lack this quality of love, nothing we do to, will impress God. Not even faith is as great as love. We can have faith, oh God, I believe you're going to work. I believe you're going to do great things. But boy, do I hate that guy. You're missing the mark by a long shot. And Paul makes it clear with no hesitation. He says in first, you can disagree with, don't get me wrong, you can disagree with the person. You can radically disagree with the person. You still have to love those people. They can be on the other side of the religious aisle, the other side of the political aisle, the other side of hockey team aisle, which is the greatest sin of all. But you still got to love them. Paul makes it clear with no hesitation in 1 Corinthians 13 that without love we are nothing. And he makes sure that there is no confusion when it comes to this truth. He says that we can have all, all the faith in the world, even sacrificing our lives. But without love, God considers them as without value and without meaning. You can die for Christ. If you don't love people and love God, you've done it for nothing. Paul does this through a literary tool of hyperbole. Hyperbole, hyperbole is an extreme exaggeration. If I've told you once, I've told you a million times. That's hyperbole. Hyperbole. There we go. It's to exaggerate to make your point. It's not meant to distort the truth, but to deliver the truth with a bang. A kid walking up with just given $20 that says, I'm a millionaire. That's hyperbole. Are they a millionaire? No, they're a $20 heir, whatever that's called. But they're making the point that they're rich beyond their expectations. Without love, our words have no value. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Even if we could speak every language on earth, and even if we could speak every angelic language, if what we say lacks love, then we might as well save our breath. We're told that even when we speak the truth, we're to do so in love. Not in harshness, not in judgment. We do it in love. I've had people tell me what they think of me. Some did it in love, and some... Uh, uh, talking critically talk about me. I'm talking to the guys, oh, you're a great guy. That, that's easy to say to somebody. Um, but I've had people tell me in love, you know, you're good, but you need to prove on this. That's love. I've had also people come to me and be not so nice and tell me what they think of me. I'm sure we all have had those, those type of people, right? We're allowed to go and, and try to make our brothers and sisters better in Jesus, but we need to make sure that we do it in love. If we confront each other and there's no love, if all we're doing is criticizing, condemning, complaining, and our words become hurtful, so even if we could speak every language on earth and could gab with the angel Gabriel himself, without love, it's worthless and nothing. Without love, our knowledge is lacking. 1 Corinthians 13, 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and knowledge, but have not love, I am nothing. Even without, uh, even possessing, sorry, the supernatural knowledge of God or having the gift of foreknowledge without love, it's nothing and lacks credibility. While learning itself is essential for success, especially in ministry, as Paul says to Timothy, to study to show himself approved as a workman needing not to be ashamed. What Paul here says that is if we don't have love, then all the studying and all the degrees, all the Bible reading in the world will do you no good. Bible plus love is what we're called to do. Without love, our faith is useless. And though I have all faith in that so I, I could remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. If we think that our faith in God or belonging to this religion or that religion or this membership uh, in a membership in a church or denomination is going to help us in life and then in the life to come, then we're pretty sadly mistaken. 
In fact, Paul goes as far as saying that if he had a miracle working faith and could move uh, the Aspen Ski Resort to, to Miami, but he didn't have love, it'd be nothing. Wow, a lot of people. But it would mean nothing. In fact, Jesus said in the last days, there will be those who say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name? And Jesus will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So without love, the Apostle Paul said that all the miracles in the world are useless. Without love, and this is my last little sub-point, without love, our sacrifice has no benefit. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, I can ask you today, and some of you might willingly do it, to empty your wallets out and say, we're going to give money to the poor. And you do that. But if you did it begrudgingly and without love, you just did it because you know, all you ask me, I guess so, I'll do it. It means nothing. But if you do it in love, imagine the blessings that pour down upon you. If I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. And this is where a lot of people fail in their understanding of God. They think that if they do the good works of feeding the poor, which is good, and, and helping the needy, which is good, that basically says they're okay with Jesus. We do those things because we love Jesus and we love people. But if we don't love Jesus and we don't love people and we do those things, it makes no difference to our relationship with God and whether we're going to heaven or not. Jesus said, Come you, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And when they asked him, when did they see him like this and perform these deeds? deeds? Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did this to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. This is kind of like the Good Samaritan. Think about the story of the Good Samaritan. All the people that walk by the man on the road. All the people that should have had a relationship with God and had the love and the compassion had no love and compassion. But yet here comes this stinky, dirty, rotten Samaritan. God can't possibly use somebody like that. And he walks along and sees the guy on the road and he cares for him. Why? Love. He did it because he loved and cared for that person. The Levite or the, or the priest could have did it out of, you know, oh, I guess I got to do it. Not in love. They didn't. They chose to walk by him. They had no love and compassion. Instead, instead this man, this Samaritan, loves. Jesus was saying with that parable many things. But he was showing that the, the Samaritan, one who the Jews would say did not know God, knew God better than the ones that should have known God. Because they did it, he did it in love. Doesn't mean good works get you to heaven, but it shows our relationship with the Father when we do things that God, that shows our loves to people. What Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians 13, 3 is that without this sort of love, giving has no value. Even if we make the ultimate sacrifice and dying for what we say we believe in or, or martyrdom, Paul said, that's not enough without love. King David reveals this in Psalm 51, which is probably my favorite psalm in all the Bible, when he was asking for God's forgiveness and what he did with his sin with Bathsheba. He said, For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. Now, while this speaks to our need to be truly repentant for our sins, the point is that sacrifices do not make things right between us and God. God, if you only forgive me, I'll give all I have to the church. I'll give all I have to the poor. It doesn't work that way. 
God forgives because he loves, and, he, and we need to love him back for that free gift forgiveness. Jesus said it this way to the Pharisees. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Now the word mercy is God not punishing for us as our sins deserve. It's deliverance for God's, from God's judgment. And Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice and he did so out of love, pure love for you and I. And that he gave to us an example of sacrificial love and how we're to live our lives. Hopefully we can see why love is life's driving priority and how just essential it is and how it exceeds everything else we can do as believers. And so what I'm asking you today, are we willing to love in this way? That is to love God with the whole of who we are, our body, mind, soul, and strength. And then are we willing to love others in the same way? That's the love that the Lord is looking for from all those who are His. Love then truly is life's driving priority, and it's truly our job description. Church, what the world needs to see today in you is the in the lives of God's people is love. Not hate, not fear. Love. I wasn't very loving this morning. Just a moment. I was driving by um, Shoppers Drug Mart, and a guy, I was probably me to the church, Road chairs, like I pulled it in front of me, so I honked my horn at him, and then he pulled into another parking spot. I don't understand, like along the road there. And I looked at him and slowed down and shook my head at him, but I was thinking bad things about him. Let, let me be honest. Not, not vile things, but I'm thinking, wow, you know, the way we are, right? I wasn't very loving at that moment. Well, Ray saying sarcastic remarks about me, I just know it underneath his mask. I'm very sorry. <laughs> oh, thanks, sorry. It was you. <laughs> You see, we need to be better examples of Jesus Christ. Doesn't mean we're going to have, not going to have our slip-ups. How many people have slipped up this week when, de when dealing with another person? Unless you weren't around people, you probably all of us, right? We're all going to slip up. But we need to say, God, I want to be better and more loving each day, every day. Let's close in prayer today. And can I encourage you to love to make it a priority in your life that you want to love people, even when the, the unlovely people. God, I'm just asking God to bring to your mind today somebody that you're finding it difficult to deal with. And I want to pray right now that God would just give a spirit of love between you and that person. God, right now in Jesus' name, as we think of, of different people that might, uh, we might struggle with, Lord God, I pray right now that you'd help give us a love that is beyond compare for them. I pray that you restore love in, our, in marriages, Lord God. I pray that you'd restore love in relationships, Lord God. You'd restore love in friendships. You'd restore love, Lord God, between neighbors. That, Lord God, you'd help us love one another as you would have us love. Because, God, we need to show love because you have given us love. Freely we have received, so freely we give. So, God, today, may this church be known for their love. May, they, may, may Lord God, even though the name is New Life Assembly, may we be called New Love Assembly, just for uh, the way people know us, I pray. God, I pray a blessing upon this congregation and this people, those watching at home, Lord God. I pray right now you'd be with them, that you'd, you'd increase their territory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, God bless you.